With a male heir secure and his heart broken after the death of James Seymour, Henry used his fourth marriage to forge political alliances. Under the guidance of his closest advisor, Henry became engaged to Anne of Cleves in order to submit an alliance with her brother, the ruler of a Protestant territory in Germany. Henry believed that this alliance was necessary because, as of 1539, there were rumors that two major Catholic powers, France and the Holy Roman Empire, were plotting to attack Protestant England. The engagement to Anna Cleves established ties between England and the Lutheran enemies of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Anna of Cleves was born in 1515 in Dusseldorf, Germany. She had no formal education, but again, this was not uncommon at the time. Having no idea what his future bride looked like, the artist Hans Holbein was sent to paint portraits of Anne and her sister. He was instructed by Henry's advisors to paint them in a good light. Artists of royal portraits tended to play up the looks of their subjects anyway, so these instructions were surely taken to heart. Henry was quite pleased with the portrait. Holbein's portrait of Anne showed an attractive young woman with fair hair, a doll-like face, and delicate features. In 1539, the marriage treaty was made official. Anne arrived in England and met her fiancé for the first time on January 1st, 1540. Henry was so impatient to see his future bride that he walked in on her unannounced as she arrived in Rochester. Having no idea what he looked like and speaking very little English, Anne did not know who the king was and did not acknowledge or curtsy to him. This, along with her not being as attractive as her portrait had indicated, caused Henry to instantly dislike her. He famously shouted, I like her not, I like her not, at his advisor when the meeting was over. This seems like a rather harsh take, considering some of her faux pas were honest mistakes. Take it down a peg, Henry. At this point, it was too late to cancel the wedding, as the marriage treaty was already in place. Anne and a reluctant Henry were married on January 6, 1540, just five days after she arrived in England. Henry might have stuck the marriage out except that the alliance between the Catholic powers failed to transpire and he no longer felt the marriage to be a political necessity. The marriage only lasted six months before Henry succeeded in having it annulled on July 9th, 1540. Unlike Catherine of Aragon, Anne did not put up a fight when Henry requested the annulment. She was rewarded for her cooperation with a large income and a home at Hever Castle in Kent, the former home of the Boleyn family. She was accorded an exalted status as the king's sister. This position gave her precedence over all English subjects, with the exception of Henry's children and any future wife he might take. Anne of Cleves tends to get a bad rap for being the ugly, discarded queen of England's most married monarch, which is not a fair representation of her appearance or fate at all. It is important to point out that the negative accounts of her appearance only began to surface after Henry expressed such a strong aversion towards her. Sounds like ye old piling on. Additionally, Henry wasn't exactly a prized stallion at this point either. To put it plainly, he was an obese, middle-aged man, a far cry from the studliness of his youth. When he first became king, he had a trim 32-inch waist. By the time he met Anne of Cleves, it had grown to nearly 52 inches. If anyone had grounds to be repulsed, it was Anne. Moreover, it says much for Anne's strength of character that she took the king's rejection in stride and adapted to her new life with dignity. In some ways, you could argue that Anne fared the best out of all Henry's wives. She kept her head, she lived out her days comfortably with all the riches and honors of being a royal, and she was not saddled with being married to an obese, aging, and increasingly tyrannical king. And, as the cherry on top, she would go on to outlive Henry and all his other wives. Anne of Cleves lived out the rest of her days on the Hever property given to her by her former husband. She maintained a friendly relationship with Henry and his children. She died on July 16, 1557, at the age of 41. Henry's children ordered that the king's sister receive a royally lavish funeral at Westminster Abbey.
true to form, Henry VIII already had his eye on his next bride before his annulment to Anne of Cleves was granted. His fifth wife would be Catherine Howard, a distant cousin of Anne Boleyn. Once again, Catherine's exact birthday is unknown, but it was most likely in 1521. Though they were of noble blood, Catherine's family was relatively poor. As one of ten children, Catherine was sent away to be raised by her grandmother, the Duchess of Norfolk. Over time, Catherine's fatal flaws would prove to be her foolishness and lack of self-control. She grew up in an extremely permissive household, and as a result, never really had to face the consequences of her flirtatious and flighty behavior. This immaturity did not impact her much in her youth or during her early days at court, but it would prove to be her undoing once she became queen. As a teenager, Catherine had a series of flings with at least three different gentlemen. Some were consummated, others were merely flirtations, and at least one included discussions of marriage. All that changed when Catherine arrived at court in late 1539 as a lady-in-waiting to Anne of Cleves. During her time at court, she caught the eye of the aging king. Are we seeing a pattern yet, Henry? Catherine had grown into a happy and vivacious young lady. Much like her cousin Anne Boleyn, she was not conventionally beautiful, but extremely charming and graceful. These qualities must have been utterly seductive to Henry in comparison to the quiet, unassuming Anne of Cleves. Catherine's charm and sexual magnetism were simultaneously her greatest strengths and weaknesses. They succeeded in attracting the king's interest, but they continued to lead her into increasingly risky situations. Flirtatious and adulterous behavior that could be tolerated by any other lady of the court was treason for a queen. Catherine's family was both delighted and fearful concerning Henry's infatuation. Though they were of old, noble English blood, the family had butted heads with previous generations of Tudors, and the legacy of Anne Boleyn cast a long shadow over the family. Catherine's personality also made them nervous. Could she sustain the king's attraction? And would she mature into a woman worthy of being Queen of England? Despite their concerns, they were not willing to risk the king's wrath by pointing these things out. It didn't take long for Henry to start publicly favoring Catherine. In April of 1540, she was given land seized from a felon, and just a few weeks later, he sent her an expensive quilted sarconet, a luxurious textile. It is possible that Henry and Catherine consummated their relationship around April or May of that year, as there was a sudden urgency to annul Henry's current marriage to Anne of Cleves. Henry and Catherine Howard were married on July 28, 1540, at Oatlands Palace in Surrey, just 19 days after his fourth marriage was annulled. Henry was nearly 50 years old when the couple wed, while Catherine was no more than 19. But Catherine's affection and youthful energy seemed to temporarily ease the pain in the king's aging body. Despite a few problematic character traits, Catherine was seen as a last hope for the conservative faction at Henry's court, who wished to see the restoration of the Catholic faith in England. Unlike her cousin Anne Boleyn, Catherine's personal and political success did not depend on the Protestant faith. She had been raised Catholic, and despite her less-than-saintly personality, she represented the conservative faith to those around her. Catherine Howard was never officially crowned Queen of England. It suggested that Henry VIII was short on funds at this time and simply couldn't afford the ceremony. It's also possible, much like James Seymour, that he wished to wait until Catherine bore him a son before holding the coronation. Though Henry already had one son in line to inherit the throne, having another male heir would provide additional security for the Tudor dynasty, should anything happen to Prince Edward. That being said, the king's fondness for his new wife was apparent. He was physically affectionate with her in public, and courtiers seemed sure that a child would soon follow. It's unknown whether Catherine Howard had any romantic feelings toward Henry. She likely did not love him in the passionate or romantic sense of the word, but it seems she loved him for the affection and generosity he showed her. She took great pride in ensuring her sick and aged husband's happiness. 